Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're doing something a little bit different. I have with me Paul Robinson. So Paul Robinson is a British author um, and he's a thyroid patient advocate. He has personally uh, suffered from hypothyroidism and was able to recover with the use of T3 thyroid medication, which we're gonna be talking about in detail today. Paul has authored three books, including Recovering with T3, the CT3M Handbook and the Thyroid Patient Manual. So Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for uh, talking to me, it's great. Absolutely. I'm really excited to have you here. I think uh, we're going to talk about some good stuff here, as we were just uh, mentioning before. So what I want to do, Paul, is could you just give us a little bit of information on your own personal thyroid journey, you know, your story, how you got diagnosed, you know, that that sort of thing. I want people to sort of have a background of you. Okay. Well, this is a, I mean, I'm, I'm 63 this year. So this is like a, this is long, long time ago in a galaxy far away. Okay. A That's long right. time ago. So this is, I started, I, I was, probably about 28 when I first started to have any issues and and I didn't know I had issues because thyroid disease as you very well know Dr. Charles is very insidious it mm -hmm. it kind of creeps up on someone with with symptoms that are that kind of so general that you don't even realize they're going on so for two or three years I got more fatigue I put weight on I started to have difficulty remembering things and things like that and then it got to a point where one day I just took my heart rate randomly for some reason and and it was 42 and my heart rate is normally low 80s high 70s so I thought my god I've got a heart problem I'm, I'm gonna die so I took myself off to my doctor straight away it was a heart issue I mean everything else I didn't even realize was a thyroid issue yeah no clue what a thyroid was at that point uh -huh. God, do it. God, I have a clue now. But yeah. then I didn't have any clue. So I took myself off the doctor. And 30 years ago, medicine seemed to be kind of a bit more flexible. And my Jeep, my doctor, my family doctor, um, she tested a whole bunch of things. I don't know everything she tested. She will have tested iron, B12 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But believe me, she tested TSH, FT4, FT3. Oh, wow. APO. Yeah, that's good. And TG auto antibodies, right? Yeah. Can you believe these days you have to plead to oh, get yeah. those tested? That's abnormal for sure. <laughs> that's abnormal. Yeah. But that's a long time ago. And think medicine's got more um, more money driven and mm -hmm. things are tied and there's more more processes in place that stop people more stop doctors doing the right thing, in my view. Anyway, so she tested all that. And the next thing I knew is I had a fuck because she signed me off from work. I couldn't work. Signed me off from work. And um, she said, I'm going to come around and see you. So this is a house visit. So I'm off work. And by the way, I, I absolutely loved my job at that point. I, you know, I was the first guy in the R&D lab um, every day at 4, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., turning the lights on. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely loved my job. So having this going on and being signed off work was a really huge deal for me. I hated it. Mm -hmm. So she turned up and she said, um, you've got a thyroid problem. You have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Your TSH is about 70. It should be like three or four. Your FT3 and FT4 are barely registering. They're really low. Mm -hmm. and your antibodies like 300 tpo was 300 or something so you got you go basically got hashimoto thyroiditis and she tried to explain to me briefly what a thyroid was what it did and what it meant to me mm -hmm. and then she uttered the immortal lines however i've got this little bottle of thyroxine t4 you just take one of these every day and you'll be fine yeah solved problem solved yeah yeah that, that sounds about right um so when so let's let's start there then, because I know that, you know, if, if anybody who knows you, they know that um, that's a, clearly not the end of your story, right? Because no. level thyroxine is we, I think it's euthyrox is the common version in uh, the UK, right? Is that what it's called? Euthyrox? I'm not sure now, to be honest. I, yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know what it was called back then, to be honest. Yeah, I don't, I don't either, to be honest. But um, I do know that uh, obviously from your story, level thyroxine or euthyrox or T4 only thyroid medication, that didn't really help you much. So what yeah. I want to know is how you got from you know, being incapacitated to the point where you, you know, you weren't able to work, uh, where your doctor was writing you off to, you know, that you, you were able to stay home to now yeah. where you're at now, like where I would consider you, you know, and I, yeah. I want to hear from your own mouth here, what you think about yeah. this, but you're wow. very functional, like probably up to hundred percent of what you would consider to be normal, at least what that's I'm seeing here. So how did you go from there to here? Um, well, that's a long, that took me 10 years. Yeah, that, that's a story. I know. And I went through multiple family doctors. I went through 
endocrinologists, several endocrinologists and private ones, which I paid good money to. Yeah. And every time I visited one, I was kind of getting optimistic that this is the one that will fix it. And about three years in, four years on, I went to a big Oxford bookstore called Blackwell's and I bought about seven or eight endocrinology books because I was so fed up with this by then. I didn't believe anything I was being told. Yeah, for sure. I figured something was wrong. I knew it was a thyroid problem. I knew the medication wasn't working. So something's wrong. So there's something in the, 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 the research somewhere that, that is explaining this. So I got the books. I spent a couple of years reading them, but it's pretty obvious straight away. Mm -hmm. I, I, my theory was that I didn't have the same level of T3 after being on thyroxine that I had before. And that's likely to be the issue because T3 is the active hormone. It's the only one that binds the receptors in the cell nucleus. Mm -hmm. The rest of it don't do that. T4 doesn't, RT3 doesn't, nothing binds to it. It's just T3. So right, I went right. to all these endos and said, look, I think I've got less T3 now than before. So can you give me some T3? And they said, no, that's not that. You've got your FT3 is in the range. Yeah, it was low in the range, but it was in the range. Yeah. And, you know, so eventually I, I basically did my research. I made my mind up what was what I needed. And I tried to find someone who would prescribe it. And eventually I did. I put okay. myself okay. on it. But by that stage, my health was completely wrecked. Yeah. And I got yeah. low cortisol as well. Super low cortisol. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about, I think we will talk about the cortisol as well, but um, I do want to focus on just the T3 for a second here, because mm -hmm. obviously you have a book recovering with T3 um, and a lot of patients, uh, thyroid patients who might be listening to this may be a little confused on that. So um, you did kind of briefly mention the distinction between T, T4 and T3, and I just want to reiterate that. And I want you to talk a little bit more about T3 in a second here, but um, as Paul was saying, T3 is far more biologically active than T4 is, you know, and, and the studies that I've looked at, <clears throat> excuse me, put that somewhere between you know, 200 to 300 times more biologically active than T4. And then also its influence on the TSH um, level itself is, is, is significantly more uh, compared to T4 as well. So when you take even small amounts of T3, you'll see a, a wider impact on TSH compared to T4. Yeah. And so, but most people, they don't even know what T3 is, right? Like most, most thyroid patients, I would say. But yeah. T3, um, you can give it just like you can T4 in a prescription medication. So Paul, right. could you talk a little bit about um, T3 prescription medication, you know, perhaps such as the names that it might be known as. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that and how you kind of can use yeah, it well, and, and your experience. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's do the bit of the context like you talked about as well. I mean, most thyroid patients take, take T4 mm -hmm. and T4 is fine in a lot of cases mm -hmm. and um, because it converts pretty well to T3 and the thyroid patients taking T4 get enough T3 in, in many cases that they don't even know anything about t3 they're happy with the t4 it which works but the t4 itself is relatively inert it doesn't actually connect to the receptors inside the cell where the cell nucleus is where all the work happens in every single cell in the body it's only the t3 that does that so if the people taking t4 get enough t3 great they're in good shape but if they don't then they're in big trouble because they need extra T3. T3 is the active hormone. And basically the T3 comes in all kinds of forms. You can get it within natural desiccated thyroid because that has T4 and T3 in it. You get it in brands like Cytomel. You get it in generic brands, uh, Liathyronine. Um, it can be taken on its own. It can be taken with T4 medication to have a combination for those people that had, can't quite manage without a little bit of extra T3. And, and T4, T3 combinations allow people to adjust the balance. Mm -hmm. So they can get their T3 levels up a little bit higher. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of possibilities there, but, you know, T4 is great. It's great for a lot of people, but for some people, it just fails utterly to do the job because it doesn't generate the level of T3 that's required. And there are lots of reasons for that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and just so, you know, I want to kind of go on to that point. So a lot of people perhaps watching this are probably, they probably fall into that category where T3 would be beneficial, you know, because as, as Paul was mentioning, um, a lot of the people who take T4 medication who are able to convert that T4 into T3, they're going to be probably fine, right? They're, they're going to be feeling okay. They're not going to have reason to be searching out um, information, watching videos, reading blog posts, reading books like Paul's written, stuff like that, because they feel okay. But there are, there is a huge number of people who do not. And so what I want to ask you, Paul, is how do you know if you're a thyroid patient listening to this, how do you know if you're somebody who could benefit potentially from the use of T3 medication? 
Well, there's two, two ways. I think the most important thing that people find um, is that they've probably been on T4 medication for a year, two years, maybe longer. I mean, it took me seven years, right? <laughs> I've gone yeah. through this. Hopefully people don't have to do that as long these days. Oh, I but agree, yeah. They'll, they'll, end, they'll end up having their T4 medication cycled up in terms of dosing. They'll, they'll have it lowered. The doctors will be tweaking it around, looking at what changes in the labs. Um, if they're lucky, they'll have FT3 tested as well. Mm -hmm. Quite often FT3 doesn't change a lot, or if it does go up, their reverse T3 level will go up with it. Mm -hmm. which is a really big issue because a lot of the T3 doesn't get used, it gets blocked. So they'll end up basically not feeling a huge amount of improvement, d d regardless of what T4 dose they're on. That's mm -hmm. one big indicator. Okay. The second big indicator, second clues there, is if someone's got thyroid tissue that's been destroyed, either through thyroidectomy or through Hashimoto's that's gone on a long time, then they'll lose thyroid tissue. And if you've lost thyroid tissue, you're in big problems because the thyroid contributes more T3 from conversion than any other organ, more than the liver, more than the kidneys, more than the gut, anything else. And if you've lost a lot of thyroid tissue, you've lost conversion. So that's T3 you can't get from T4 anymore. Mm -hmm. So that might well mean that you would benefit. And some people lose 25%, even 40% of their conversion capability by losing the thyroid gland. If you've got gene defects as well, there are gene defects that impair the conversion ability from T4 to T3. So those things can be discovered and there'll be big clues as to whether someone needs some T3. But pr pr mostly it's just through, you know, you'll go through this exercise of trying different T4 doses and basically you're left symptomatic. Mm -hmm. So you've got this group of people who are trying, you know, the traditional method, let's just say the T4 method combined with testing the TSH, right? That's what most endocrinologists and most family practice doctors are doing. You've been doing this for some period of time. How long do you think that would be, you know, six to 12 months before you say, you know what, this isn't working for me. Would you say two years? You know, how long would you give that time? I period? wouldn't leave it two years. Life's too short. Oh, I agree completely. Yeah. I, I mean, when I was looking at this, this study, it was talking about the average length of, of uh, time that thyroid patients um, have symptoms before, you know, they, they try to seek other help. And it's on the order of like 10 years, five to 10 years. Okay. I mean, I, I, and this, I, I'm, I haven't published this yet, but I'm re, I've got a blog post lined up exactly on this topic. I'm really okay. passionate about this whole idea mm -hmm. of you cannot let this go on because mm -hmm. there is such a lot of collateral damage to a person's so. life, to their jobs, their careers, their relationships, um, everything. You can't, uh, that, you can't t low hypothyroidism causes cardiovascular disease. It causes osteoporosis. It can be... More, it's linked to cancer. You cannot let it go on. Mm -hmm. It has to get treated fast. That's the best way to deal with it. I 100% agree with that. You know, and I, I see patients who are saying, you know, they'll 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 leave comments. I'm sure you get this all the time. They'll send me emails. They'll say, you know, I'm, I'm working with my my doctor. They're just not listening to me. They're not running the test. I'm like, oh, you know, and they'll say this has been going on for whatever 18 months. And I'm like, you know, the doctor is not living in your shoes. The doctor doesn't know what it, what it's like to live day to day like you are living. And every day that you do that, every month that you do that, even, you know, heaven forbid, every year you do that, you're missing out on a big chunk of your life, you know, even I'm a percentage. I've right? spoke to people that have had it for 40 or 50 years before yeah. they get on T3 and feel better. Absolutely, which is just bonkers. But, you know, this is it. So if there's one thing you take away, um, hopefully you take away a lot more than this, but do do something right away. You know, if that, if that means finding a new doctor, whatever it is, we'll talk about that in a minute here. But I want to kind of stay on the topic of T3 for a second here. So, Paul, let's talk about a little bit of the safety of T3. You know, because if a thyroid patient comes into their doctor and they say, you know, I'm not feeling good on level thyroxine, my T3 is low, my TSH is normal, but my T3 is still low. I think I need more T3, kind of like how you were saying. And your doctor says well, their, their objection is going to be something like, no, it's going to be harmful. We can't do it. It's not right. You know, it's not going to be as regulated as C4. So what, what do you think? Let's talk about the safety of T3. So give me your, give me your thoughts on that. My thoughts on that. <laughs> is that there's a heck of a lot. Oh, whatever, whatever. whatever a lot you... of dogmatic teaching okay. in universities to doctors and endocrinologists yeah. that's finding its way out into medical practice mm -hmm. and it mostly is complete rubbish absolute rubbish mm -hmm. most agree. the things that are linked to osteoporosis are well two things hyperthyroidism for one thing and then proper hyperthyroidism where particularly when someone's not on thyroid medication and they do have genuine hyperthyroidism like graves disease yeah sure then they've got they've got 
self-generated FT3 levels that are too high, and that can cause osteoporosis, but the biggest cause is hypothyroidism and low estrogen, to be honest, but hypothyroidism. Heart disease, biggest issues, cardiovascular issues are hypothyroidism, again, not T3, not T3. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I'm sick, I'm sick. I really have heard this so many times from patients that their doctors think, their doctors tell them, oh, you can't, we can't give you T3, you're gonna have a heart attack. Right, we can't right. give you T3, it's gonna cause osteoporosis. And the research does not support that. It mm. just simply doesn't support it. T3, be it in combination with T4 or be it on its own, if it's correctly dosed for the person and their clinical presentation improves and, and, and they have no, no heart rate issues, no EKG issues, no BP issues, no any issues at all, it, it's, it, it's the most natural thing in the world. Mm -hmm. T3 is what works inside the cells. It's not, it's not a problem. Yeah, that, that, that always that always cracks me up, right? It's BS, it's BS. And actually, I think it's because a lot of the, the doctors and the endocrinologists have just been taught that. Right. And it's just too easy for them to say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so let me let me just sort of uh, kind of come back to what Paul's saying here. So he's talking, you're talking basically about um, the two major um, things that the that an endocrinologist will say. They'll say it's going to cause atrial fibrillation, which is a heart related problem. And they'll say it will cause osteoporosis. But as, as kind of Paul was saying, um, which I think is really important, so I want to kind of reiterate it. He's basically saying, if you dose it correctly, um, these, these, the risks for the two, these two conditions are probably non-existent. And if anything, probably protective against other um, related issues, you know? And so that's kind of, that's kind of been my sense. It's funny as I hear you talk, I'm like, it's like, you're like, it's like talking to myself, you know, maybe an older version of myself. So um, no, I a hundred percent agree with that. Um, and so I just wanted to, I wanted to clarify that for, for anybody listening, because they're going to get that objection, right? It'll be the atrial fibrillation and or the osteoporosis, um, but that doesn't have to be an issue. Um, so what I want to do, oh yeah, go ahead, Bob. I'm going to say, I know people have built bone with T3 on T3 only Absolutely. on high doses of T3. In fact, I know people have basically resolved their heart issues on T3. Okay. Uh, so it's the reverse. It's that I, 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 I just, I'm sick and tired of hearing these doctors say that. Mm -hmm. It's really and, not right. I agree with that. And, and what I've seen anyways, and you mentioned this previously with the low estrogen is when women start to develop osteoporosis and heart disease occurs around the age of menopause. It's actually five to 10 years after that. And it's more related in my opinion, I think to, to the decline in estrogen than it is to you know, the thyroid function itself. Now, what people will say though, uh, what doctors will say is that they're really afraid of the, the drop in the TSH. So I kind of mentioned this previously, and I think you did as well, is that when you take T3, I, I know you're laughing, we'll, we'll talk about that, but um, when you take T3, it, it is the case that T3 will cause the TSH to drop more than T4 will, right? I think, I think we probably both agree, both agree with that. And so I think what ends up happening is you have a lot of people who use T3 who end up with a TSH that's probably on the lower end. So let's talk um, a little bit about that. Are you concerned if somebody is taking T3? Actually, I want two questions here because I hear this a lot. So number one, I get the idea or I've, I've got the impression from thyroid patients who believe that no matter what dose of T3 you're taking, it will always cause TSH suppression or a low TSH. Um, and number two, what do you think about the TSH and what role does that play um, in relation to the dose of T3 medication that you might be taking? So we're kind of getting a little bit of the weeds here, but I think it's important for um, anyone who's considering using T3. Low TSH, firstly, is not a risk. It, it, it does not matter at all. It has no, no impact on heart disease, osteoporosis, anything. I, I really couldn't care less about TSH most of the time. The only caveat to that would be if someone is on T4 medication as well as T3, then actually TSH is involved in the regulation of conversion rate of T4 to T3. So as TSH comes down, that T4 that they're taking will tend to go to more reverse T3 and less to FT3, in which case all you need to do is, is lower the T4 dose, possibly increase the T3 dose. TSH, I couldn't care less about, frankly. It's, and, and the problem we've got is, and I think, again, it's a, it's a matter of money. TSH is often the only thing that doctors, and, uh, doctors are testing. Sure. And it, it's not relevant. It really isn't relevant most of the time. It's relevant if someone's not on thyroid meds, if they're not a thyroid patient. Agreed. Because Agreed. that means, that means, yeah, they, if the TSH is super low, that could mean they, they've got graphs or they've got hypothyroidism. But one on, once on thyroid medication, there's absolutely clear research on this. There's several papers on this. Mm -hmm. Once on thyroid medication, um, 
TSH doesn't matter anymore. It's, it's quite it's quite quite safe for it to be low. It's not relevant. What is important is FT3 and the clinical presentation of the patient. Are they are they actually hyperthyroid? And, and in most cases, these people are not. And yet, and often, often because their TSH is low, their doctor is dropping their thyroid meds and making them sicker again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so yeah, basically, uh, I, I totally agree with that. And I see this all the time, you know, we'll see, we'll see uh, patients who, let's say they're on hundred micrograms of T4, their TSH goes down to, I don't know, 0.05, right? Not even, it's just, you know, maybe slightly low, but not really low. And their doctor says, you're going hyperthyroid. And I want to, I want to kind of come back to that point for a second, because essentially what you said here is that the TSH by itself is not necessarily a, a proven marker of the state of hyperthyroidism right? Um, what, what Paul was mentioned before is that you must have the combination of your symptoms along with the, the TSH level in order to ascertain what is actually happening with your thyroid status. Um, and so I kind of want to, with that idea, I kind of want to shift into thyroid lab testing. Um, we kind of mentioned this a little bit previously, but I, I think it's really important to talk about. And I know something um, that I kind of gathered from what Paul had said previously, which is, I think will be a good uh, uh, talking point here. And that has to do with optimal thyroid lab ranges. So when we look at the the, let's call it the um, less conventional thyroid community, including people like me, we'll, we'll advocate for a different set of ranges within the thyroid lab test. So we'll say, okay, let's get the TSH, but instead of looking at the standard range of, let's say 0.5 to 4.5, your TSH should be a one. And then let's look at free T3. And in the case of free T3, your, you know, the range is, I don't know, let's say 2.5 to 4.5. You want to be in the top 25% uh, of that range. So Paul, what are your thoughts on this these optimal ranges versus the normal ranges, and how does this play a role into using T3 and your experience and all of that? Wow, okay, good question. Um, let me start with uh, two pieces of research, and I'm not gonna be, it's in my the Thyroid Patients Manual book, and I'm not okay. gonna be able to remember the authors and the titles just like that. That's but fine, yeah, yeah. There's two pieces of research. One one is uh, it's by a guy called Stig Larson, I remember his name. Um, one piece of research has been done that shows that you know, you've got, you've got a lab range, FT3 or FT4 lab range, it's yay big, it's based on a population of people that, that they, they assess, right? His research shows when studying, studying individuals, a large number of individuals, and working out what, they, what dose they need to be on and what their FT3 or FT4 level needs to be, he's found out that basically most people need to be in a space within that lab range, which is less than half as wide as the population range. And that's the only place they can be in if they're gonna be healthy. So 38% was the figure, if I remember, okay. typically. Okay. And, and so just being in the range, somewhere in the range, doesn't mean you're healthy. Right, right. So my analogy to that is always that it's a, it's a baseball and a barn door. You've got a huge barn door and you've got baseball. Most doctors are really happy if, the, if that ball's thrown and it hits the barn door. It's in the range. Anywhere, yeah. Anywhere in the range, except really the reality is there's actually a smaller circle mm. in chalk on that barn door, and that ball has to hit the circle. If it's not in the circle, the patient won't be well. Mm. So the FT3 and FT4, for them as an individual, has to be in the right space. So having a population range is fine, but you can't just look at the results and say, oh, it's in the range, it's okay, but how many times do we hear that that's what patients have been told? Yeah, normal, Countless. right. Yeah? yeah, standard. It's mm -hmm. not. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, another piece of research is that FT3, the FT3 lab test, is the only lab test that can be done that actually tracks symptoms. It, it goes up as symptoms improve. It goes down as symptoms worsen. Mm -hmm. The others don't. FT4 doesn't. TSH doesn't. Just FT3. Mm -hmm. And yet, FT3 is often the test that's not done. Right. If you're lucky, you'll get a free T4, uh, you know, with TSH to free T4. And so yeah. I think that's really important. Uh, what do you think about um, the role of reverse T3 um, in relation to free T3? Are you an advocate for getting reverse T3 testing? Do you think it plays a role to help somebody clinically determine their dose? What are your thoughts on reverse T3? Okay, my thoughts on FT3 are really based again on research. And, that, and, 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 and this is where I, this, I, I go at everything from the science, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way I approach it. Um, FT, uh, reverse T3 itself does very little. It's just, it's just, a, it's just what T4 is converted to, to clear t excess T4. Mm. Um, basically, the enzyme that converts T4 to reverse T3 is called D3 deodinase. Mm -hmm. D3 deodinase does have a very sinister effect in the cell, though. In the cell, if D3 is there, 
the T3 hormone can't get to the cell nucleus. It actually blocks it. Mm. So rather than reverse T3 being a blocker, it's the D3 enzyme that's converting T4 to, t to reverse T3 that blocks it. So exactly. if your reverse T3 is high, you, it doesn't matter what your FT3 level is. You're not going to get all of that FT3 usable. It's going to get blocked. Mm -hmm. So it's useful if someone's not if someone's not responding to a to a T3 T4 T3 combination. It is useful to see reverse T3 because if reverse T3 is high, then chances are that FT3 level they've got is not actually effective. It's actually low, effectively lower than that. I see. Okay. So it's useful, but I don't believe in any T FT3 to RT3 ratio or okay. fixed numbers. I think you just have to look at the the way the patients responded to T4, T3, and then check the things and see if, if RT3 is high, well, maybe I need to review, reduce the T4, increase the T3. Just use a bit of common sense, because I don't think you can just look at numbers and use specific ratios of things like FT3 and RT3. Yeah, and I, I think that people have a tendency to focus on numbers. I, I noticed that when I was working in the hospital, there was an, an obsession with numbers and um, to the exclusion of the of how the patient is actually looking, you know? So you have this obsession with numbers and you're ignoring clinically what is actually happening. It clinically just means how you're presenting your, what you're feeling. So if the person has, I, I don't know, let's say um, a, a TSH of 0 0.01 and a free T3 of 3.5, but they're feeling 100%, well, then that, that's good for this patient. You know, it's like, okay, great, you're, you're doing well. And conversely, you could have somebody who has similar lab results, but not fit well. And so I see this tendency among thyroid patients to be like, what did you do? You know, how, where, where are your labs so that I can match them? And I, I don't, I, I haven't seen that to be very effective. Um, would you say, or, or would you agree that um, thyroid lab tests really need to be, the, the ranges that work for, for people need to be individualized and sort of, you know, at that level? Or would you say there's some way that I can, that we can look at a range and say, you know, for this amount, for, the, for most patients, they feel better like this. And, you know, so stay away from this or X, Y, and Z. Like, what do you think about that general statement? Um, I, I'm, uh, yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I, I think I, I've got a tendency to, to think we should have different lab ranges for different types of medication. Oh, okay. So, I like that. So a T4, a T4 treatment, maybe you should have a, a type of lab range for FT4 and FT3. A T4, T3 treatment, maybe you should have a different lab range. Mm -hmm. And a T3 only, God, that needs a different lab range. For sure. Really yeah. different lab range, which allows a much higher top level of FT3 than it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have this example of my wife who takes T3 only. I think, you know, we mentioned that previously. Um, yeah. And uh, her free T3, when I check it sometimes, is nine or 10. You know, and her, the reference range is like three or four, you know, the top end. And so I, I don't get concerned at all. I check her heart rate. Her heart rate's fine. She has no hyperthyroid symptoms. I just, I don't get concerned about that. Um, and I know other people too. Um, so let, let's do this though, Paul. I want, I want to ask one more question. If, uh, if you're a, let's imagine that somebody's listening to this, they're not doing well on level thyroxine because um, that's what they're taking, or maybe even uh, something like T3, uh, a low dose. Do you have an idea of what type of range that you've seen in patients in terms of how much T3 they actually need? Because I'll see people that will get on T3. They'll be on like five micrograms. They'll be taking 75 mics of, of level thyroxine and five mics of, of cytomel, let's say. And they're like, you know, T3 didn't work for me. Um, and, and whenever I hear that, I just sort of, I'm like, oh no, that's it's really looking at it the wrong way. Um, so, and I know it's hard to give dose ranges, but if somebody's listening to this, they're maybe falling in that category. What have you seen, um, but either personally or with other people that you've helped? Um, I know you've done some coaching um, or some, you know, some, some stuff like that. What kind of range of T3 do you see uh, most people fall into? Just a broad range here. Well, firstly, I started working with people about 15 years ago, well before I wrote the first book, because I need to make sure the book was not just about my protocol for me. I need to generalize it. So I worked with Perfect. probably well over a thousand people on T3 oh, nice. okay, over that time. A lot. That's a good experience, by the way, for anyone listening. Yeah, yeah. a lot. More so, than your endocrinologist, by the way, a lot more. So I've worked with a lot of people um, and I would say it depends on what they're doing. If they're, if they're, if they respond reasonably well to T4 and only need a little bit of adjustment, then that's a different, different dose range. So, you know, in that case, say they say they're almost right with hundred micrograms of, of, of T4 mm. and maybe they need to come down to 80 and add five or 10 micrograms of T3. And then you just add it very slowly and look at the clinical presentation, look at maybe look at the labs a bit, but look at how the person responds. And that could be fine for them. 
Yeah. But as you go, as you can find the people that have got more serious conversion problems, they can only cope with, they can cope with far less T4. Mm. So they're going to need more T3 and, and they could, you know, they could need, you know, 20, 30, 40, whatever. I don't know. Like, yeah. And a lot of, let's go to the straight to the T3 people, right? So imagine the people that have got virtually no thyroid function. It just shut down. They've had a thyroidectomy or the, they've had Hashimoto's for a long time. That's me, by the way. Yeah. Um, and um, that they're typically, most of them fall into a category if they really need a full replacement dose of T3 to support them, somewhere between 40 and 80 micrograms of T3. That's a lot of T3 and most mm -hmm. endocrinologists would freak out at that. Um, yeah, that's 10 times what they'd recommend at five micrograms. I've been on 60 micrograms of T3. I'm on 60 micrograms, I've been on it for 15 years. I've been on T3 only for 25 years now. Yeah. And I'm completely normal. Completely He's totally fine. Yeah. I'm completely fine. I'm not yeah. a single bit hyper. I, my temperature's normal. My heart rate's normal. Everything's completely cool. And yet I haven't got a single molecule of FT4 in my system. Yeah, it's, it's just non-existent there on your lab testing. And, and my wife, just for reference, uh, is on 50 mics uh, of T3. So right around that range. Um, and I see, I would say most people um, probably somewhere between, you know, you, I think you said 40 to 80. I see, you know, probably 50 to 75 if that's T3 only, and I've even seen higher. So, I mean, it can kind of go over the place, but it's important because you're, if, you're, if you have been placed on five micrograms, and we're talking 50 micrograms and maybe the low end, you know, this is a 10 times, 10 times the difference between these two ranges. So if your doctor throws you on five, yeah, go ahead, Paul. And there's a really big problem with that as well, Dr. Charles, and that's if they've been put on five micrograms, and you've said it yourself earlier today that five micrograms of T3 tends to suppress TSH a little mm -hmm. bit more than T4. For sure. And TSH is, is basically involved in the regulation of the deodenase enzymes that convert T4 to T3. So taking T3 is liable to make their conversion rate of T4 worse. Mm -hmm. So chances are they could even been worse on five micrograms of T3 with their levo. The, you know, the end of it should be looking at, okay, well, we're going to need to drop that levo and we're going to need to really get that t3 up and it might only mean getting up to 10 or 20 micrograms but that could be the thing that gets the person from feeling absolutely crappy to feeling great mm -hmm. and they don't and, do it and, and that's what matters right at the end of the day it's how you it's it's getting thyroid patients to feel better and i think you and i are both very passionate about that um well we we have kind of reached our time limit here but i've had a, a, a really good time talking with you paul i'm really glad that we could uh, get together and do this and i'd love to do it again because i think we still have so much more to talk about um what i'd like to do though paul is if you could tell people um where to get you know where where can they find out more about you how can they purchase your books because this is really just the, the tip of the iceberg here we we have we have brushed over topics that we could talk about for hours each so tell us a little bit more about how people can get in contact with you or or you know read your information and whatnot okay well i'd recommend starting with my website really and um, my website's called paul robinson thyroid.com okay. and it's really easy to use website and it's very searchable and um, there's a great blog there and there's a, there's a little spyglass on the top they can search for any topics as that's just a great open place to start looking um my books are available on any internet bookseller including amazon and the best book to start with probably is my more general one called the thyroid patients manual and that covers lots of things it includes all the different treatments t4 t43 uh, natural desiccated thyroid and t3 treatment not in as much detail as they would need it that we're really going to set their hearts and go in t3 only mm. but it's a great book to start with um and I, i'll probably start with those two to be honest okay what i'll do is i'll put the the links to um to those to those books on amazon is that and where and then the link to your blog so that people can get to those really easily so those will be down in the description below if you guys want to do that um and if uh so check out paul's blog and we're really excited to, to have him here and We'll have to do this again. So if you enjoyed this conversation, let me know below. Um, and otherwise, that's all I got for you guys today. So thanks, Paul. Thank you very much.